Hi, I'm Matthias, and this little guy is the Astra 300, a pocket version of the previous Marshall 400. While it was intended for the civilian market, we're going to soon learn that it still found its way into military service. But before all that, I know you all are squinting, so let's put it in the light box. Weighing in at 1.4 pounds and just a little over 6 inches in length, this is a far friendlier sized pistol than that massive 400. However, we are still a semi-automatic blowback operated handgun using a single stack detachable magazine, although the release is a little different. We have, in this case, six rounds of 380 ACP, although there was an option for seven rounds of 32. Once more, don't forget that YouTube advertising doesn't really cover even a fraction of the cost to produce this show, a documentary, every other week. No, that's all paid for by viewers like yourself. If you haven't already, please consider helping out for a monthly pittance. An actual fraction, however, is covered by our sponsor, Ballastol. Now, I promised to do a little micro history on these guys, so let's soldier on from last time. Dr. Helmut Clever, son of Friedrich and lecturer of chemistry at Karlsruhe Technical University, developed a multi-use oil for the German army in 1904. He named it Ballastol by combining the Latin words ballistic and oleum, ballistic oil. Now, of course, these are micro histories, so either wait until next time to hear more or check out Ballastol online and maybe snag from for yourself and your beloved collectibles. In our last episode, we covered the development and service history of the frankly sci-fi looking Astra 400 pistol, or as the Spanish army called it, the model 1921. You'll never guess what year it was adopted and put into production. While the 400 was kind of massive, uh, you could beat someone to death with this thing, that's because of it being chambered for the 9mm Largo cartridge. Just a reminder, this was introduced into Spanish service by the Bergman 1908 pistol, which I might point out used a magazine forward of the trigger and not in the grip. The subsequent Campo Guido pistol of 1913 used the same chambering, but also a magazine in the grip. And so, as we saw on our episode on the model of 1916, that made for some awkward handling. The 400 was again chambered for Largo, and while Esperanza E. Unceta, the manufacturer, made some ergonomic improvements, it's still fairly thick around the middle. Being a blowback, this pistol is also quite heavy. It has a very strong recoil spring, well, actually recoil spring, and a big mainspring as well. In a word, it's a big one. That's fine enough for an early Marshall automatic, but not necessarily uh, a big seller on the commercial market. Now, Esperanza y Unceta had established the core of their business with the Victoria pistol, designed by Pedro Cariaga Garangarza. This pistol was the gestalt of what would become the World War I ruby. These shrouded Hammer 32 saw extensive service with the French and even the Italians. And because nearly one million were required, a number of smaller shops popped up during the war in order to make and sell these somewhat crude but reliable pistols. With that particular conflict cut short, a lot of businesses floundered and the Spanish Basque region was overloaded with out of work gun makers. There was a massive surplus of unsold ruby type pistols, which were slapped together and sold as cheaply as possible. This race to the bottom, a discount market, was obviously going to eventually bankrupt everyone involved. The smart play was to invest in better machinery and produce better quality firearms. Esperanza y Unceta had already started down this path back in 1913. Relocating and expanding for the Campo Guido, they had invested in American machinery and advanced tooling. Which actually brings us full circle to the excellent but clunky Model 400, too big for your average consumer, so it was time to diversify the product line while keeping the same level of quality. Even before the 400, they had actually introduced a 25 ACP pocket pistol built along the lines of the old Victoria. This was fine enough as an inexpensive vest gun, but many consumers wanted something more potent. So, in 1922, the 400 was scaled down. You click at the corner, you hold shift, you do the diagonal, right? They wanted to make it into an acceptable size for one of two popular blowback cartridges of the time. The smaller was the 32 automatic Colt pistol cartridge as introduced by John Browning with the FN produced pocket pistol. 32 ACP soon became the standard for early automatics using simple blowback breeches. However, for some, it was just a little too, well, little bumping up the bullet diameter to 9mm, but keeping the case length and powder charge low enough to still work well in blowback designs, 
Browning and Colt introduced the 380 ACP, also known as 9mm short in Europe. Given the dimensional similarities between the two cartridges, it was fairly easy to make pistols that could be chambered for one or the other. The most relevant to this episode was actually the FN 1910, a pistol that could handle either just by swapping the barrel. I suspect that this is important as it appears that the 1910 had a strong influence on our pistol designer Kariaga and his Astra 400. It's no surprise, therefore, that Esperanza E and Seta would chamber their scaled down civilian oriented Astra pistol for both 32 and 380 over time. Now, in addition to simply shrinking and rechambering the 400, they apparently chose to include just a couple extra improvements. The big one was the addition of a positive left side magazine release lever. This appears in an earlier patent by Cariaga, but was not adopted by the Spanish army. The second was actually a removable lanyard loop. Not easily, but you know, if you take it apart. Uh, you know what, let me just go ahead and show you this. All right, this is, uh, you know what, let's just go ahead and compare. Yeah, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things isn't gargantuan. Uh, I think the 300 does a pretty good job of showing you just how large the 400 was. <laughs> it's a big bird. All right, um, scale aside. Let's uh, zoom in and take a better look at this guy. Coming from the big boy, it's the same, but smaller, right? We've got our slide, we got our takedown, triggers in the same spot, manual safety in the same spot, automatic grip safety in the same spot. Our hero release has moved, we'll see that in a second. And in this case, we have wood grips, but the early versions of these would have also had the same horn grips with the logo. I will point out though, one screw here to hold the grip on instead of the two that were on the big boy. Otherwise, ah, it's a scaled down 400, not, not a lot to see, but there are a couple little interior differences. Let's go ahead and start with that magazine though. Much like the previous Campo Giro, this has a uh, left side button, although instead of pressing up in like the 16, I just push here and then we pull this guy out. And I have to lift it up a little bit to do that because the tab is over here, it's on the right side. So um, let me see if I can show you this better. The ergonomics are such that I push with my thumb here and I grab with my index finger there and therefore can pull it out fairly easily. At least that's the idea. I find this to be quite stiff on this particular pistol. I've popped off the left grip because frankly, we're not gonna animate this guy just for a magazine change. You can see how it works here. We have a spring set up under there, a lever arm, a pin that holds it in place, and there's where the tab grabs. So if I insert the magazine, uh, you'll see that this notch will line up with that catch, and that's just gonna be how she holds. But boy, you can see that thing dragging on the magazine the entire way through. The reason it pops back out, by the way, is the follower pressure. <sighs> While we have this guy apart, let's go ahead and take a look right here. That's our lanyard ring. You can tell it's optional and removable. This can be drifted out and replaced with not having a lanyard ring. Comparing to the old 400, we don't have the witness holes anymore. We have this nice big stripe. We can see all of our rounds. In this case, this is a six round 380 magazine, or you could have a seven round 32 magazine. Of course, the gun would have to have the correct barrel for that to work out. Again, toe position's totally different, but we saw that before. Being in 380 or 32, this guy is sprung a lot lighter than its slightly older and much larger brother. Again, uh, hold open on empty. And if we release that mag, which, oh lord, is so stiff. Yeah, that is much more delightful to use than the bigger gun. Uh, I will point out the manual safety does work the same way as the big boy, but it does not serve as a slide hold open, a manual one. So if we ride this for takedown, start pushing that in. No, we got nothing all the way until the end. That's unfortunate because it means when you go to take this gun apart, while it is the same as the other one, we push in, turn, release all that pressure. Uh, instead of, you know what, let me zoom in. Instead of using the lever on the other side, we have two witness marks here. So you would actually push this guy back until those line up and then you can turn your barrel and release it from the action. That makes this harder to do our trick where we could take the gun apart without releasing the recoil spring, but it's not too difficult as it would be on the more heavily sprung one. And so it saved them from making an extra notch on the other side of the slide. I actually think that's a bit of a, bad decision on their part on this one because it is just a simple notch on the other side of the slide. I, I don't know why they didn't do that. Other than these few changes, and of course it's diminutive size, there are no significant mechanical differences between this and the 400. So I think we can skip the animation and just go straight to letting May try it out.
Now, this little pistol, unlike the previous 400, was oriented towards commercial sales right from the start, so it's no surprise that you can find these with various platings, engravings, and even gold damasking, not to mention custom grips. I should also point out that unlike the Astro Model 400, the 300 was woven into the overall company serial line. That means it begins after serial number 350,000, as general production of other models had reached about 340,000 by that time. Around 1934, the serial number actually jumped to around 505,000. Proving to be a popular seller, part of the allure of the 300 was the fact that it was not chambered for 9mm Parabellum or 9mm Largo. In certain countries like Spain, these cartridges merited extra state attention as they were military rounds. And despite that distinction, the 300 still managed to find its way back into military and police service. Known users include prison guards, the police school in Madrid, the Bilboa and Granada police, the Carabineros, port security, and the Coast Guard. Some even went to the Spanish Navy, Army Artillery, and Air Force. The Model 300 also managed to worm its way into the holsters of a number of officers, often thanks to the imprecise language used on the regulations for various positions and at various times. Often, your directive was to buy an Astra 9mm pistol, which, yeah, technically this is an Astra in 9mm. It's just short. Now, just like with the 400, the Model 300 will be sucked into the Spanish Civil War. While I'm unsure of procurement by the Republican government during the actual war, we do know that some were supplied to the semi-autonomous Euskadi government. Following the bombing of Guernica in April of 1937 and its subsequent capture by the Nationalists, the Astra 300s started to flow towards Franco. During the war, and somewhat beyond, the Nationalist government would take in fairly large numbers of the Model 300, though I'm unsure of their issue and use. Even during the Spanish Civil War, there would be foreign sales, sort of. From 1937 until the end of the war, over 300 Model 300s were sold to the German Condor Legion, the very same that had bombed Guernica. By the way, if you're curious about your Model 300 and where it served, I highly recommend Leonardo Antares' book. He has lovely tables to help you navigate all these government contracts in detail, way more than I could do in this video today. Following the Spanish Civil War, the Condor Legion went home and Encietas' company was returned to private hands. But it wasn't left in an ideal situation. Franco Spain was tougher on private ownership of firearms, and it restricted who could make them. Enceta thankfully made the cut. Interesting point, Juan Esperanza, Enceta's former partner who had left back in 1925, had gone on to start a business of his own making mortars, but he also bought up a patent for the Alcar pistol. Esperanza had begun exploring the production of his own clone of the Model 400 pistol and likely some other designs. This effort was halted by the war and then by the post-war government. Facing economic challenges, Enceta y Campania was likely not too terribly upset to see the rest of Europe erupt into a war uh, that did not, by the way, include Spain directly. This was, of course, the start of the Second World War, particular to our story today, the successful German invasion of France gave them a common border with Spain. While this wasn't immediately put to use, the overstretched German armed forces would soon be reaching for Spanish pistols. Is there a world war? Then I guess Spain is making handguns. From 1941 through 1944, most of Incetta's production would be taken up by German orders. Last time we saw these sales began with 6,000 Model 400s and 9mm Largo. They were available and they worked. They were also delivered in two lots in October and November of 1941. What's new for this episode though is that these lots also included 6,000 Astra Model 300s chambered for the 380 ACP cartridge, known in Germany as 9mm Kurs. These pistols for Germany had no special additional markings as they were already proof fired in Spain and this was deemed enough. They also had standard production logo grips, so not like this one. Uh, this would change as the contracts proceeded, of, of course. Through 1942, 17,200 more Astra 300s in 380 would be delivered to Germany. Plain checkered wood grips replaced the commercial logos sometime around serial number 552,000, and the barrels were marked with 9mm and 380. At the back right corner, a Waffenamt mark is now applied. This was an acceptance mark of the German Army Weapons Agency. For the Astra 300 in 380, it was number 251. 
In January of 1942, 400 Model 300s in 32 ACP were shipped to Germany. These were not Waffenamt Mark. And while we're in 1942, I should mention that Uncerte y Campania incorporated that same year, now named Uncerte y CSA. In 1943, more waves of 380s totaling some 32,800 pistols. In 1944, three deliveries brought 21,990 examples of the 32 caliber. Only one contract for the 380, 7,000 units. The same year, however, there would be a new model introduced. The little 300 was pretty handy, but it just wasn't ever intended to be a proper military pistol. That was the purpose of, well, the Model 400. Yet as I covered, the Germans weren't particularly interested in the 9mm Largo cartridge. They were using 9mm Parabellum, introduced long ago with their adoption of the Luger Toggle Lock pistol. This was essentially a straight-walled version of the 30 Luger, and unlike the Spanish 9mm, its shorter length is easier to work with when designing a pistol with the magazine set in the grip. German ordnance wanted to know if the Model 400 could be adapted to Parabellum and shortened up just a bit. Turns out, yeah, that's actually not too difficult to do, which is why I get to actually introduce this, the German contracted Astra Model 600, also known as the Pistol 43. Light box. The overall length now stretches just a little over eight inches, and we're not even clearing 2.2 pounds, so it's handier than the original 400. The chambering has changed to nine millimeter parabellum, and so has the grip. We still have an eight round detachable single stack magazine, although the release is different. Now, just to clarify something, we have now covered the Astra's 300, 400, and 600. That skip comes from the Astra Model 500, a flare pistol developed all the way back in 1921. So what all changes had to be made? Well, let's take a look. All right, we have, boom, the big old 600, which isn't so big when you compare it to what is still the monster that is the 400. I, I cannot get over how big this handgun is. I didn't think of it as that big until I started just comparing it to everything else in the room. This thing's huge. But as you can see, we have lost a little bit of length. Uh, you know what, let me make that a little easier for you guys. Okay. Well, my centering skills aren't great, but you know, we've come down a bit right there, but probably the bigger issue is the girth. Look at that. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but as someone putting their hands on it, this, I'm pretty much wrapping around to these knuckles right here. Whereas this guy, I'm able to get a nice full grip. This is good. Honestly, it's easier to tell them apart in terms of how thick they are by the magazines. 9mm Largo, 9mm Parabellum. That's a significant savings, and it really comes out when you have to wrap around that grip. Not quite the same as before, but fairly similar. Slide operated, big ulcerations, manual safety triggers there. We've got our takedown system that's exactly the same. Wood grips because of uh, being later on, but it's not uh, impossible to find 400s with the same wood grips. Two screws, because it's the big boy, uh, grip safety, and then coming from our 300, yep, we've got our fancy release. And this one, for whatever reason, is actually nice and smooth, like really pleasant. On the top, we no longer have the Astra logo. Instead, we're just over here. We're written Unseta e Campania, S-A, mm -hmm. and we have Guernica Espana, Astra, in quotation marks, mod for model or modello, and then we have 600 slash 43 9mm Parabellum. And that really is about the biggest difference here, the chambering. Takedown works exactly the same. As a matter of fact, just like the 400, we even have that takedown position that allows us to more easily uh, rotate that barrel and pull her apart. So there really isn't any operational difference between this and the 400 as long as you understand this particular release. We don't have one of the rare naval 400s that had this release, but if we did, other than the cartridge and then the dimensions, this would be exactly the same as that. Again, mechanically, internally, there's not a real difference between this and the 400, so we can actually get this straight over to May for a demonstration.
Seems functional enough. The German army received 50 sample pistols in early 1944. These were found acceptable and serial production was begun rapidly. The first deliveries arrived in May. Germany apparently contracted for 50,000 units as a whole. However, with the Allied invasion, Hendaya France soon fell out of German control, meaning they could no longer reliably receive their Spanish pistols. The last delivery of the 600s was made in July. In just three lots, plus the initial 50, only 10,500 of these guys were actually received during the war. Those Germany actually got a hold of were marked by the Waffenamt D20 at that rear right tang again. Service for all of the Astras in Germany gets a little bit weird to track down. Those marked by the Waffenamt at least went through the army to some degree, but plenty were not marked as such and might have had special destinations. Suggestions include that the 32 ACP 300s went to the Luftwaffe, that the Model 400s were actually used uh, in policing in Norway, and of course there are claims of the Waffen SS all around. I've been unable to really confirm any with primary evidence. Now, despite being cut off from their pistols, the German army had already paid uh, well ahead of time on a lot of the contract. Specifically, it seems 31,350 more pistols had been paid for and were dutifully assembled. However, they could not be delivered, so they were turned over to the Spanish government. Around 1951, these were sold to the West German army and police. Paid for twice, it seems. I've also seen the claim another 14,000 were sold from Inceta's stock, implying they had assembled that many without pay. Or maybe with pay, but not giving them to the Spanish government, it's a little confusing. This number seems to fit with the total production, but I haven't put a solid finger on it to be sure. Still back in 1944, Inceta had a fair few parts and pieces left over, so they would assemble another 3,500 or so pistols. These were sold in smaller lots to Portugal, Chile, Jordan, and Turkey. Even smaller numbers were sold to the Philippines, Costa Rica, Egypt, and a few to Thailand. Manufacture of the Model 600 ended in 1945, with 59,400 produced. And while we're talking totals, the Model 300 was halted in 1946, with 171,300 in total being well produced. Just shy of half had wound up in Germany, actually. Now, like the Astra Model 400 and the later 800, the 300 was replaced with an updated model, in this case the 3000. Following the war, however, sales dropped dramatically, not just due to domestic laws, but also because Spain's limited involvement in the war and its nationalist government saw it slapped with economic penalties. Worse yet, Vincieta lost the 1946 competition for Spain's new service pistol, but we covered the Stars takeover last time. Vincieta, however, did not fail. Instead, the company diversified into more uh, products, mostly industrial equipment. It also managed to restructure and struggled along for some years, still introducing the occasional new product. But those are stories for another time. For now, we'll set the 400 aside. We already covered that, but we have two new Astras and we need May's opinion. All right, once more, we have May. Hello. We have a schmattering. We do of, uh, schmattering. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, we have this Campo Giro here right now. If we had the other Campo Giro, I feel like we would have the complete All the tubes. In, in set to, uh tube gun collection, but I say that, but then there's the 800 Condor and all that other yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We <laughs> almost have a, all the tubes. By the way, on that episode, I showed me the 800 Condor when we were doing that, you know, set up for that asset. Mm -hmm. I want to shoot that. Yeah. That you know rad. it's still blowback. It's going to shoot just like... Oh, it'll be terrible. <laughs> I still want to try it. Okay. Um, on to these guys, though. Yep. So the first one we shot was the 400, which obviously coming from the 400, thank you, uh, we decided it's massive. It's kind of awkward for how big it is. It's hefty. Recoil's not great. Trigger's not great. The, the, the mag release on this one isn't that great. About the only thing that worked well or was kind of good was the safety. It's decent pretty decent. Position. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, a lot of the ergonomics of this gun suffer from the fact that it used 9mm Largo. Right. So instead, so that meant, you know, hard springs to pull against. That meant the recoil was going to be pretty bad for this guy. So, yeah, eh, a lot of things that kind of trickled down from that. Well, I also just, I just meant the length of the grip. Oh, uh, that too. Because the cartridge is long, right. literally, in the name. So, um, let's skip the chronological order. Because normally we'd go to the 300. Yeah, so then the six. this guy came out, and then within probably about a year, this guy came out, and then a decade later, 
No, the, um, two decades later. Yeah. And some change. Mm-hmm. This guy came out. It's so like 20. It's actually interesting to think about it. They're all pretty, basically the same gun, but there's 20. Two years, 21, two years between these two. It'll years. be easier to work our way down size wise. That way we can be like, okay, this one's slightly different in X ways and then move on. Yeah, you could be born just in time for this guy and then be drinking in America by the time this guy came out. Okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's do the 600. Okay. Uh, let's get that in your hand because it's the most Ooh, similar dimension. It already feels better for that grip because I'm guessing not having to do 9mm Largo, we're in Parabellum territory now. Yeah, it's almost like that was a cartridge designed to be... I want to be fair. I want to be very fair. Largo was designed for a pistol that had the magazine not in the grip. Mm-hmm. It was also designed for a lock breech pistol. And then Spain decided that we're going to break all the rules. Right. So, it's... <sighs> I can't imagine why this... I, honestly, the biggest confusion to me, and I probably didn't voice it enough in the Campo Guido episode, yeah. why they stuck with Largo. I, 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 I do not understand why they stuck with it when they had so few of the Bergman pistols. Mm-hmm. They could have made the change here. Right. You know, and then once this... Okay, I get it. It's hard to make the change after this. Sure. Okay, sorry. Anyway, um, so the grip already definitely feels better. It's not as girthy, so I'm able to get a nice, solid purchase on that. So that's pretty fantastic. Um, I've still got eight rounds. Nice. Okay, cool. Haven't changed anything there. We've obviously reduced our length on this gun too, which feels way better. The lightness of it actually, it does feel significantly better in my hand. I disagree. Why? Because uh, I like the idea of having a semi-automatic butt line. I've seen at least one example of one with an extended barrel and shroud. Uh I want that. I want like, I want eight inches of barrel off the front of this so I can just beat people over the head. And then I want to mount a bayonet. Okay. You can do your weird silly thing. I'm going to be here in reality land where I've got my thing. Um, No taste. Now, this one right now, the slide is way easier to operate. (laughs) Because that has that janky spring in there. Yes. This one, unfortunately, um, the original spring that's in this guy wasn't really feeling great. So with permission from the owner, we swapped it out with the 400 spring while we were on range. Yeah. That, performance was way better. I'm going to, uh, yeah, uh, tell, talk about recoil for a second, and then we'll go into that. Yeah, so essentially, um, let me actually go through the whole thing in order. So I'm loading in the mag, and instantly, that's way better. I'm not having to fight that awkward heel release on that, on the head on the 400, where push it back, push yeah, you got to push in. against that right, spring that's in What's there. What's different? This one, nice push button. Oh, it's positive. You see I have a push, push button. Look. Yeah, but mine pushes, look how... Yeah, okay. Yeah, I haven't your... imprinted my thumb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I can follow with gravity. <laughs> I, I wish the cameras could see this. I haven't imprinted my thumb from yeah, just doing do. that twice. And then you're having to fight the heel to push it back. No, I can just go straight in. Done. A little bit of flaring, and honestly, it'd be really zippy. I know, right? I kind of like that. And there's also a nice little toe here on the side that can give me some extra push with that. But it's very, it's very really natural to pinch. It. I kind of don't need it because once you pinch it, it's such a nice positive release with that that I'm actually causing it to catch here at the bottom and not come all the way out. Whereas before you saw, it just fell free. Yeah, but if it had gotten dirty, you'd be able to yank it out. Yep, so, without any sort of concern. Feature. Okay. Um, I remember operating the slide with the 400 spring in there. It really wasn't as bad as the 400 was. Yes, there's a secret. Would you like to know? I know. Would you like to know? Hold I on. do know the secret. Let's see. Hold on, ready? I'm going to wiggle the slide. That's, we, that's the sound of silence. Now you wiggle your side. We next talked to your about mic. that last episode. That one's really tight. Whereas but, this one. Yeah, it's different. So I essentially got to feel what the 400 would have been like if it wasn't so dang tight for that fitting. Whereas this one, loose, and it was still easy, way easier to operate. I just got a nice solid grip. Weirdly, I like putting the serrations here on my palm with these guys almost a little bit. And that was way easier for me to get that guy open. Okay. Loved it. Uh, sights are the same. Mm-hmm. Kind of still sad. Um, trigger. Trigger. Unfortunately, the same. Uh, it was still very <laughs> bad. Yeah. Still the same take up, which. You had about 3,000. Well, maybe it's not quite you, as you, gritty. You take up of what, 3,000s? But the weight and was then, still the same. And then it's just like, crisp. Yeah. <laughs> not fantastic. No. No. And then recoil is still, there's still much, there's still a fair bit of recoil on uh, we, this guy. We'll have to do a side by side, but. Um, yeah, because I think we kept the camera pretty close to each other. So we might be able to see a very comparable side by side in the in the high speed for that. They are definitely very close from, from initial observations. Yep. Uh, which is fair because it's the same recoil spring. It's about the same mass. Uh-huh. I know when we're handling it and we're moving at such, such low speeds, we're getting a little bit of drag from this fitment. Yep. 
but I don't think that that tight fit's really doing much for us when an actual case is coming flying back, no. right? So, um, both cartridges are fairly <laughs> close in power, right? At least enough that I'm pretty sure the recoil balanced out pretty well, yeah. You know, so there should be a pretty similar recoil profile between the both of them. Mm -hmm. Um, but otherwise, comparably, it in a lot of ways feels like a smaller version of the 400, except. At least we have this improved mag release down here that I like, and I'm enjoying the smaller size overall. It fits me, fits my hand better. Right. Cool. Now, on the nature of individuality in these guns, looser fit and a way lighter spring when I got a hold of it. The spring was yeah. so light that it was alarming to me. Uh, with owner permission, we test fired it with the light spring. Right. Mm, it was it was aggressively snappy. Um, I it, wasn't there for it, but I heard stories. And it ran flawlessly with the higher pressure spring, so I think that was probably the way to go. Yeah, I think so. Uh, that thing felt like it was trying to beat itself to death with that light spring in there. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. This is always going to be the case with the show, though. There's always going to be little changes along the way that we don't catch, or uh, metallurgy is going to have changed over 100 years. Yep, these aren't fresh made from the factory ARs. Yeah. yeah. So uh, <laughs> we often get asked to do higher level comparisons that mm -hmm. we actually can't do because the, the, the pistols themselves or rifles themselves have wear. The ammunition's different than it actually Everything was. Everything would pretty much have to be worn identically in order for us well, to do an identical test, practically. I would need like five factory new compared to five factory new with original period ammo that was fresh, not even now a hundred year old ammo where it's deteriorated and it's doing weird things. Right. It's kind of impossible to do the micro comparison that, and this is really more I'm complaining about ballistics. People really want ballistics tests. So I'm mm -hmm. going, guys, this is... The, 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 yeah, yeah it, lots of stuff affects ballistics in weird ways. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're getting there to just get a, a feel for yeah, the gun. Yeah, I think so. Um, okay, so... So Mama Bear, I'm thinking is better. Okay, between these two? I think I prefer Mama Bear over Papa Bear. How much of a gap are we talking about here? Like, how much confidence boost is there in that versus this? Um, Pretty, pretty significant. I would say 40% improvement? No, thirty percent. I'm gonna go with thirty percent improvement. Really, I think you're. I think I think you're selling it short. Really? Yeah, I think the what, what bumps it over thirty percent for you? Because I'm thinking improved mag release, but I still have the terrible trigger recoil is still pretty up there. And the ma magazine and then, capacity is the same. Right. What we're really talking about is two features. We're talking well, three, I guess. Uh, balance is slightly improved. Slightly improved balance, with, yes. With a little weight. So we'll that's, just say weight. I'm going to say that's my 20%. Weight and balance is right there, okay? Mm -hmm. Grip. Ergonomics of the grip oh, yeah, is true. vastly better because okay, I'm 40%. actually uncomfortable. I'll go back up to 40. I'm uncomfortable in this gun, and I have big yeah, hands. Yeah, you have big hands, too. That's saying something. I mean, I can use it, but I'm uncomfortable. It's that. It's almost like a bar of soap. I'm very comfortable on that. Yeah, this one's quite comfy. And then also the magazine, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but when, but you, only, quick loads? when you only have eight rounds and you might need to reload... Mm -hmm. Being able to take a magazine and in a hurry get it in there without having to get caught on and, and frankly there's there's the capacity to significantly damage the back of the magazine using this heel release system that's on mm -hmm. this gun. Although you... I will be I will wonder, um were were quick reloads or multi reloads a thing that were being considered post war um in pistols? Because frankly that was not something in the war they were really thinking much on. As long as you have a spare magazine issued. That is a consideration. Okay. Um, I honestly couldn't say whether or not these came standard with a spare magazine. I don't think I saw... Boy, that's hard to think of. I know, now. right? Certain armies were better than others, and I don't recall in Spanish now. I guess I should have picked that up in the episode. Um, regardless, <laughs> I am going to... If it has a detachable magazine, I am going to assess it as if it's supposed to have rapid load. I would consider that as well, yes. So I would actually give at least a 50% bo bonus to okay. this guy. I'm still at 40. Okay. I'm still 40. Okay, If fine. I have that you're spare magazine... You're wrong, mag but you're fine. Okay. Oh. Mm. I'm wrong. What about with the 300? <laughs> okay, first impressions. <laughs> wow, this is um, <laughs> it's like half the size. Yeah. You could fit it inside of the it's 600. A, it's like a ch it's like a chibi version. <laughs> it is like a chibi version. Um, even for me though, this feels very small. This feels a lot like a lot of the uh, pocket pistols that we've handled for the World War One series we've been doing. Yeah, this actually brought us back around to I believe we compared it to the Savage. Yes, actually. We're kind of in that zone. Although we don't have 10 rounds. We've no. only got six. <laughs> it's kind of chubby for only six rounds. I know, it? right? It's it's pretty to be fat fair, this, in general this, for six rounds. The Savage was 32 and 32 only. Yeah. They didn't do a... An, I know the Savage had 380s. Nobody get on me about that. But they didn't have, for the 07 Savage, mm -hmm. they didn't have a 
uh, an adaptation where you just swap the barrel and the magazine and boom, you have 380. Right. Like, this is barrel and magazines. Well, not magazines, barrel swap. Mm -hmm. And then I, maybe the feed lips tweaked. And then boom, you're into. It's kind of cool. I get to have uh, either round choice. That's kind of nice. Well, not if as I a have kit, spare. you get to pick between the two. Oh yeah, that's true. So, so you either have seven rounds of thirty-two, or I believe six rounds of three eighty. Yeah. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Fine. I get to you know choose whichever round I want, either extra capacity or extra power. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but no, a lot of these features just feel like they are just like the six hundred. So I can see where the six hundred just came from. This one essentially. Mm -hmm. um, we have the improved mag release, which is on the six hundred. Cool. Although this one feels stuck for some reason. There we go. Oh Jesus, that button is worn. Although still positively popped it out. That's kind of good. Yeah, I haven't gone through. They're they're not mine to sort of play with at the moment. But there is something. If you pull the mag on that one, that one's dragging in the mag well, and yeah. I cannot figure out why. Yeah, I just don't, I sometimes sus I just don't want to release. <laughs> I suspect, given the fact that the six hundred works so well, mm -hmm. that's unique to that particular example. Okay. But I haven't handled another three hundred in a while, so I can't recall. Fair. Um, obviously, everything kind of feels a little easier to reach. The safety, super easy for me to... It's right with my thumb where I actually end up laying it, yeah, so that's kind of good. Okay. And then just point and drop it. Yeah, not too bad? No, I don't, I don't have to change anything practically with this one. So okay. everything is literally there for my thumb. What? I, knew I forgot to try that on. Oh, God, it's a little hard to put on. No, I can just draw the yeah, it's, vast. That one's still that one's still close enough. Seventy with my thumb percent that it's not bad. better. Oh, okay, seventy. No, well, you laugh, but no, hold I'm on. Not God, that's really awkward. Yes. That's that's a huge. It one is too. improved. Um, the trigger was better. It was a little bit better. Okay. It wasn't it's quite little, as uh, a little bit better. It was a little bit better. It wasn't quite as heavy on the three hundred. I remember that. Um, and then obviously recoil improvement. What about the sights? They're the same, just smaller. <laughs> They're even smaller. <laughs> Just, well, I mean, small everything. Everything got reduced with this gun. Like, yeah. They literally, technically, technically, we went from the four hundred to the three hundred. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. They got a yeah. little bit bigger again for this guy, I guess. <laughs> but it, it it basically just feels like a giant reduction, and then the improvement with the with the actual um, magazine release. That's it. There's yeah. not really much of a change <laughs> for a for a pocket pistol. Not bad sights. No. Well, no. No, I guess not. Not in that era. No. Nineteen twenty two. Uh, we've seen some pretty terrible pocket pistol sights. And obviously I'm not having to work as hard to rack that mag, which is kind of No, nice. that's all original and that's running well. Nice. Okay. Well, overall, um, it, Baby Bear is doing pretty good in terms of just improvements for me being able to handle, but I don't like that small cartridge. <laughs> yeah. And you don't like having only six rounds of it? No. So... If you had to pick one to fight with? 600? I think I'd go 600, yeah. Perhaps, just because yeah. that one really just... Improvements between that and the four, and then that and the three. It's it's a really good medium point. I can see why they wanted to bump the three hundred back up for a Marshall pistol out of the three combat combat. This, mm -hmm. um, I will say, if I'm an officer and I don't expect to get into a shootout, okay, I probably would pick that for concealment purposes. No, not even concealed, just because it's lighter. It's on the thing. I'm getting like I get eight rounds of nine millimeter parabellum. Mm -hmm. Great. If my statistical likelihood of getting into a shootout is like less than three percent than you know of normal not not three percent over the course of my life but like you know uh, something that's uh, infantry nco or something that's sure. on the line yeah okay but then me i'm on desk duty or uh i'm in transport and you don't want anything to kind of like be massive on you or whatever you want something that's easy to tote the around vast the the absolute expectation for me is that it would be it, something has gone totally tits up if i end up in combat mm -hmm. that Sure. All day. Or even like a pilot, because there's also rumors that these went to the loof up. Cool. It, you know, chances are it's really a last ditch weapon. Mm -hmm. That all day. Okay. I but can see that. in terms of direct combat, yeah, this. Yeah, 600 all day long. Yeah. Well, um. Now, which one's the most pleasant to shoot? Just on the range. Oh, the 300. Just because I can actually use the trigger without it being a nightmare. And I might be able to rack the slide. Everything about that was just easier for me to handle. Because nothing was insanely heavy or ridiculously stiff. <laughs> now, you've shot other pocket pistols. Would you rate it as a good pocket pistol, a mediocre pocket pistol? Um, I mean, we've handled a fair few of these for the series, and the vast majority, I want to say, have been in 32. Yeah, FN 1910, we had an option for 380. Yep. That was with a barrel swap. Right. Remember that? And oh, then God, I'm, I'm really struggling to think of it. 32 was far more popular in World War One, and then 380 yeah. became more popular in World War Two. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is like 
not the first one, but one of the earlier ones that we see moving into 380. I can't even remember if we shot a Colt 19 or 3 in 380, which is a much larger pocket pistol. Maybe we did? Oh my god, my brain. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> For but, this whole show, but... I mean... Just on its own merits, though. Not too bad. It's also not as snappy as some of the other ones either, so... It's kind of hefty, but it's still pretty small. Yeah. I like how thick the grip is. Yeah. For, it, for me, it's nice, because mm -hmm. I have to tuck the pinky still, but it's... Other than that, it's very... And six rounds was pretty average, yeah. actually. There were, there were some that went up to seven, occasionally eight, and then the Savage obviously went to ten. Well, then it's all 32 as yeah. well. I mean, you're talking exactly. about six, seven rounds of 32. This is six rounds of 380. So right. in that period... Better, yeah. Right. Seven rounds of 32, six rounds of 380. You're essentially okay. getting... It's you're getting a, You're getting a revolver's worth of magazine, mm -hmm. but you don't have that cylinder thickness to, to take care of in your pocket. Right. We've actually got an, actu an actual slim pocket pistol version of that. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'll take it. Okay. Well... Any final thoughts? Um, I'd like to try a better, smaller Campo Giro, but I don't think they did that. <laughs> you want the Campo Giro in 9mm Parabellum? <laughs> oh. That uh, might fix that this actually horrible... would fix that grip a yeah. little bit, but it wouldn't fix the weird bloop of a trigger and anything else. <laughs> they probably still keep that spring in there for the, for the, the main they, spring. The way they just slap the trigger in there reminds me of the Nambu, kind of. Oh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, and trigger. <laughs> so. It's like, crap, I forgot to put the trigger on. Just put it somewhere up there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's get rid of the Campo Guido for a second. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah. it draws your eye. Uh, anyway, I'm still for overall the 600 as the the main boy to pick. That one's still like... Wait, the 600? Yeah, 600 okay. is still number one. We slapped the 300, so I got confused. No, sorry, I was just putting it on the table. Oh. No, the 600 is still obviously going to inspire the most confidence in me for handling, yeah. I think. I think the 600 does a lot to reveal how 9mm Parabellum was a cartridge designed to actually have a magazine go into the grip. Mm -hmm. uh, it really, getting away from Largo cleans up a lot of Spain's problems, which is why they eventually get away from Largo. Uh, in the meantime, we just have to deal with this and keep cramming it into random guns, which is, there's so many, there's so many silly Spanish guns I can't wait to cover. Actually, the interesting thing is, uh, and we kind of started talking about this, I think in the other episode, I might've gotten distracted. I don't oh. remember. I don't recall. Okay. But because of the, because of the great war, mm -hmm. most of the major powers had surpluses like crazy. Mm -hmm. So you don't see a lot of innovation in the major powers when it comes to rifles and pistols. Uh, in terms of automatics, they go nuts. The light machine gun becomes this thing everybody's paying attention to. Right. And they start to ignore everything else. As you get into the late 20s and early 30s, you see people starting to pay attention to automatic rifles. But you actually don't see a lot of handgun innovation until the later 30s. Like mid to late 30s, you really start seeing the adoption of more modern handguns. There's some beautiful names in that period that we become very familiar with. But most of the interwar period is taken up by the further evolution of pocket pistols for the uh, civilian market and police market in some ways. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of service, service handguns, Spain actually does the most poking around for at least the early 20s because Spain was out of World War One. Does it also have a lot have to do with um, their things like we were talking about patents before as far as it being easier for them? Uh, they can get away with patents. Some stuff's still under protection. Right. But also they're sort of this isolated economy and they have handgun makers in the country. And so you get really weird, goofy things like the Jolo R and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So... Uh, there's, there's some fun to be had in Spanish handgun world in the interwar period. And then you start to see things like the P38 or the high power and stuff like that emerging elsewhere. Uh, the French, it's interesting how many guns sort of appear in like 1935, 1938, 39, like they really start to appear towards the end of that okay, period. Okay, so if people have those pieces. That's actually a good point. If yeah. you have a complete collection of something, please let us know. Um, it is always better if you can loan us. Uh, the classic example I think I made on our patron podcast mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, we can borrow an SVT-40 very quickly. Oh, yeah. Borrowing an SVT-38 is more difficult, and it'd be better to do them in that order. Mm -hmm. So if you have some of these pieces and you're the kind of person that's specialized, let us know. Um, because if you have a full sw sweep on something that you care about, it's easier for us to just work with you and get through the full sweep. Mm -hmm. So let and us we know. to show off your piece. Yeah. And tell everyone how pretty it is. Yeah, and that you're the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that's got it, right? Yeah, I think that's everything. Okay. Well, everybody go out and find one of these now and yell at me for running the market. Yeah, collect your tubes. Yeah. Have a good one. Night, everybody.
the t- the I'm just getting ready for a photo with the, this child and right, the, you. The dad goes to take a photo of us. Uh-huh. And the woman who works, for, some woman that works for Ohio Valley Military Collectors Association, or what, how, I don't know, anyway, they would be, hey. this woman shows up mm-hmm. as, I guess, something about the young kid in the line and us already sort of being ready for a photo. She goes, oh, can I take a picture of you guys for the newsletter? Uh, I'm going, sure, but I don't know why. In context, she thought it was our kid. This is one of my happiest things, right, is when yeah. she, when things have become all screwed up and nobody else knows it but me. I know that later on, somebody's going to be looking at the newsletter and they're going to go, does Thias have a son? <laughs> <laughs> and essentially, we're the photographers, which has been a situation before in our lives, actually. Over time, a few things come up where he's kind of consulting with me on some stuff. So it appears that I might know a thing or two. Mm-hmm. And then he has to leave early for a flight. So he has to get out of there. But we still have to finish up the photography on our own. So now it's just us and the poor curatorial staff, right? Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> they're going, so you guys do like a, it's like a photography business? Oh, no, we... um. This is technically a collaboration. I'm sorry. He never actually introduced us to you. So, like, we had got in there, and he had never told them. I thought maybe they knew before we got there. That's why we weren't introduced properly. Because mm-hmm. I had just been like, oh, I'm with Thias and shook hands, you know. Mm-hmm. But I didn't make it like, oh, we're from CNR, so this is what we do. I did none of that because right. I thought it was all there. Mm-hmm. And so they're like, wait, what? <laughs> I had to explain who we are, and they're going, oh, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah. Next. Pull the slide to the rear and release the chamber our first round. This action works on a simple blowback using a large recoil spring. The fired cartridge drives the slide rearward, compressing the mainspring. Once halted, the mainspring drives the slide back forward, picking up a fresh cartridge in the process. Looking at the action, the hammer and seer share a singular...